Lord Blunkett, David, okay. welcome to this Lord Speaker's Corner. I'm delighted that you were able to make it. You've been in politics for 50 years and you've held a number of the most important jobs in the country, both at local level, when you were leader of Sheffield City Council, but also at, at national level in the Cabinet, in education, in home affairs and others. That's a long span. Where did you feel more satisfied? What job? Well, firstly, thank you for inviting me. I'm very pleased to participate. It's a difficult question because at each level, you feel that you've made a contribution and you're very pleased and proud of it, or on very rare occasions, you're in despair that you got it wrong. I, I, I think, the, I'd, I'd put it this way, there were three occasions when I knew that I was, I was really proud of being there. Firstly, as leader of Sheffield, we introduced, uh, together with uh, local authorities around the area, a, a transport policy, which was adopted eventually by what was the Greater London Council. Uh, and was a phenomenal success. The second would be at education. I was so, so pleased to have had four years to actually be able to implement policies from the introduction of Sure Start, which I did with uh, the late Tessa Jowell. Uh, I was at education, she was a junior minister in health and we, we combined it so that it was a, a joint programme. We introduced the first ever nursery programme across the country uh, which gave all four-year-olds and then eventually three-year-olds uh, a nursery education place. Uh, and we transformed, at least we started the transformation of primary education. So 400,000 youngsters were reaching the appropriate level at the age of 11 by the time I left. Now, those are, that's, those are privileges that you, you really only get the chance to do once in life. Home office was very different. I mean, the uh, attack on the World Trade Center and beyond on the 11th of September 2001, totally dislocated what I actually wanted to do. I got back to it eventually, but it was a, a, a seminal period. And the major challenge then was obviously to secure the well-being of our country. And, and although I found it really difficult, I would certainly not have swapped it because you really, as a politician, you always anchor to be at the centre of things. And education, obviously, it was satisfying, and I've read that in a number of the interviews that you've had. But I was in the Whip's office at the time, David, and I remember getting uh, messages on the wire that David Blunkett was not happy with the amendments which were not backed in the House of Lords. Now, nobody said he wanted to abolish the House of Lords, but you're now in here. Give us your views in both well, chambers. I'm, I'm very fortunate that I never said anything that uh, would make me a hypocrite about the House of Lords. In fact, I, I ended up in my latter period as an MP uh, in defending the Lords and particularly against what I thought would have been quite dangerous constitutional change. But in those days, like every other politician who's cutting their teeth in senior office, I, I, I didn't like the challenges. and. At education, I used to get quite bumptious about what was being thrown back. <laughs> we, we had the most enormous majority, you will recall, in the House of Commons, but pretty well unprecedented. And that meant actually that the House of Lords was even more important, which I didn't fully acknowledge at the time, but I certainly do now, in terms of the checks and balances that we provide uh, in our constitution. And although it's unwritten, it is absolutely fundamental because simply roller coastering over everybody is what um, a former Lord Chancellor uh, once called elective dictatorship. And we've got to avoid that so that minority vo voices are heard, people are able to think again. And there were times, particularly when I was at the Home Office, where the House of Lords asked us to think again, and we actually did. And the bill that came out of the Anti-Terrorism, Crime and Security Act, uh, uh, which was the aftermath of the 11th of September, was a much better piece of legislation, much more balanced, much more effective than it would have been had we not listened to the House of Lords with the expertise that existed there. So gradually, John, I was won over to the idea that plurality and having the chance to think again and being challenged is a good thing, not a bad thing. 
And you, you, you have to build your confidence to be able to do that. I, I always say that people who don't like challenge are often the ones who are least certain about where they're going and what they're doing and find that uh, opposition quite difficult to handle. And the more mature you get and the more confident you are, the, the better you are at being able to deal with that. And Keir Stammer has asked you to do a substantial report on skills, which I believe you're talking at an education conference later in the week. And you focus on technical and vocational education and want that streamlined. You and I have known the uh, distinction between technical and vocational. Well, when we were at school, uh, we had the academic stream and then the others went to, to technical. But Lord Baker in the House of Lords has been advocating the importance of that and you're doing that in your report here. Give us your views on that. Well, Keir Starmer said, would I produce a report on learning and skills? And I think he thought I'd produce about 20 pages and I ended up... 137? Well, 137 pages <laughs> and 25 recommendations. Working with others, uh, we, I, I produced the, the final report, but others were instrumental in giving advice and, and support. And what I tried to lay out was that if we're going to get this right for the future, we have to take on the challenge of artificial intelligence or robotics. We need to look to a world, what I'm describing at the university's conference I'm speaking at, as the uh, Leonardo da Vinci moment, where uh, you, you place emphasis on both the technical and vocational on the one hand, and the cultural and academic on the other. And of course, back at the end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century, that example was an exemplar, I think, for us now. And what I'd like us to do is to see a vocation element in the academic, the scholarship elements of uh, higher education and an academic opportunity for those who are taking vocational and technical education courses so that people can develop. We, we take for granted that medicine is both academic and vocational. Engineering is both academic uh, and, uh, and vocational. What we don't see is that in construction, in healthcare, in the challenges of net zero, we're going to have to mix the vocational and the academic because people are going to have to think entirely differently about how the world of work is operating, how they're delivering services. They're, they're going to be operating robots. They're going to be writing programs. They're going to have to be D digitally competent as well as lit literate and numerate and we've got to revise the curriculum and the way we deal with post-16 to take on the challenge of the mid 21st century rather than 19th century. Uh, absolutely. Uh, home affairs, you were only a few months in post until 9-11 struck as you mentioned. Could you describe to us first of all how did you feel at the centre of that global storm and how did you devise the UK response to the terrorist threat? Some people would say looking at your progress that you're a bit of a hard liner on, on terrorism so give us a view. Well I'd been in office three months we'd already started what I'd set out as a positive agenda for our second term in, in office and then the attack struck. I, I was actually speaking at a conference in uh, Warwick University about police reform of all things and I was on the train coming back and received a message firstly by my son actually who saw what was happening through a, a window uh, of a shop in those days televisions were sold in that way um, and then the security staff saying Downing Street want to talk to you and the, the message was very clear can you get straight back uh, we're going to hold a meeting they call it COBRA, but of course it's committee room, briefing room A, it's cabinet office briefing room A. Um, and we gathered in the, the late afternoon, early evening. And my job was domestic security. So I had to do two things. One was to reassure the public that we got a grip, that we knew what we were doing and that people could stay calm. And then secondly, to work with, the, uh, with MI5, our, our uh, domestic uh, security service and the, uh, the, the relevant parts of the police service to ensure that we'd taken every step just in case, and we anticipated there might be, a second attack 
particularly on the City of London. And we were quite surprised that there wasn't because the logic of what they'd done in New York was that they'd, they'd hit Europe as well. So in that cabinet meeting, firstly, I was, just, I was very reassured, as I didn't need to be, that Tony Blair and Gordon Brown in their respective roles had already decided that we would exude calmness and that we'd reassure people so that they would go to work or to leisure because if, if the economy had, uh, had ground to a standstill then Al-Qaeda would have got their way um, and then to work with partners in Europe and of course directly with America on what steps we might take and the, the first thing I had to do was to get out there and reassure people that we were on it and we knew what we were doing secondly to get immediate steps in place and thirdly then this legislation the anti-terrorism crime and security act and the difficulty there was this balance between maintaining civil liberties and human rights because if they were deteriorated badly then again al-qaeda would have won because our democracy would have undermined itself but secondly to ensure that we got the legislative measures on things from the Treasury, like money, anti-money laundering, because quite a lot of money was clearly going into mm. funding terrorism, on the policing and security side, that they had the powers to be able to intercept with proper oversight uh, what was the emerging technologies of the internet and the beginnings of uh, the explosion in mobile and social media. It was just at the very starting point uh, and to be in other words to be as savvy as the people we were dealing with in terms of those new m m means of communication new means of sending messages new mean means of organization and that was quite difficult and yes i, I was tough because um the, the one thing that overrides everything else as you and i know from being in government is the security of the nation if the government uh, aren't on top of that then people will lose faith in democracy and, and that would be a, a, an absolute disaster. Fine. Uh, you mentioned in a number of articles that uh, today's politicians can learn uh, what we got wrong as well as what we uh, got right. Uh, I feel that for my own part as well. But if we go back to the 9-11, the, the terror threat, the proceeds of crime bill of 2003 come in and from the vantage point of being chair of the Treasury Committee, I don't think that worked very well at the end of the day, David. And if I could combine that with, uh, say, the uh, other issues, identity cards uh, and others, uh, some would say that identity cards, you get frustrated with that and it wasn't implemented, but given the present environment, you know, I mean, for example, I came down on the plane on Monday and uh, the attendant said, I couldn't get on the plane if I didn't have identification. So I pulled out the House of Lords. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> hope it worked. It did work in this, <laughs> in this occasion. But we're in a society uh, where there's an awful lot of surveillance uh, now. Uh, could you maybe look at that 2003 Act and what I think maybe you got wrong, but also uh, the ID cards. Yeah, I, I, I think the implementation of the Proceeds of Crime Act uh, went very badly wrong mm. and was frustrating for all of us. Um, it, it was partly because this was real cutting edge uh, legislation. This was about being able to confiscate the resources, the assets of those who had no legitimate uh, uh, means of describing where they'd got those, that wealth and those assets from. And we're still struggling with that today, by the way, in terms of the international profile of money laundering and what we're asking the banks and uh, other institutions to do to try and help police a situation. Uh, we, we got it wrong because other than Republic of Ireland, no one had actually experimented with this before. And the, the police were quite reluctant to use it. And I don't think they were trained properly to do so anyway. We set up an agency that became a bureaucracy rather than a, a tool for uh, speedy and, and effective uh, implementation. And I think we, we didn't make it clear enough to everyone involved just what this was all about. And it was about where 
you, 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 you knew criminals or those who were associated with raising funds for terrorism, but you didn't have the normal uh, legal requirements to be able to prove that they were obtained by criminal means. So using the powers that we gave, and they've been updated since, um, to actually be able to intervene and demand from those individuals proof of where the resources came from was an entirely different approach. And I don't think we were smart enough in understanding how difficult that was going to be. And here we are today. So yes, um, when you're introducing something new, you sometimes have to take a step back and, and think again. And identity cards would be a good example because we had overwhelming support mm -hmm. from 2004 onwards when I started to introduce this, which gradually eroded to the point where the coalition government did away with them. But actually, if I had my time again, I'd have simply used the passport system coupled with driving licenses, which are now, of course, not paper anymore, um, because over 80% of our population, adult population, have a passport. That's the highest density in the world. 43 million people, not me of course, but 43 million people have a driving license. We could really do that in a way that is highly convenient, doesn't ask for information that's not already available um, for passports and driving licenses. And we could take out all the difficulty that people face. Most young people now are entirely used to giving out their information. In fact, Twitter, which is now called X, uh, are actually um, seeking permission to be able to use that information themselves. Others download information that people put on their smartphones and their interaction with each other uh, without that permission. Um, and I'd like it to be codified so that we knew what we were doing. In that way, we can stop the organized criminals capturing people in modern slavery, which they will do as people don't claim asylum because they're barred from claiming asylum if they get into this country and they disappear into the ether. And then how do they access public services? How, how do they access legitimate jobs? And how do we protect ourselves from the exploitation that goes with the undercutting of jobs and, and services in the sub-economy? These, these are big issues for the future. Mm. Uh, and I think we're going to have to come back to them. And you think the House of Lords is in a good position with the experience here? Well, here's, here's the rub. Mm -hmm. The House of Lords are much more enthusiastic. Every time this issue comes up on the floor of the House of Lords, there's great enthusiasm for examining this. And it's partly that the capacity of the House of Lords to look at the big picture, the, to look at issues down the line, to actually hear expertise in the chamber and in select committees, to be able to spend time examining those issues is, is far more uh, possible than it is in the House of Commons. You, you and I have been in both. We, we know that in the House of Commons, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're dealing with uh, immediate issues, uh, whether it's uh, governments trying to get their legislation through and understandably timetabling them, so there are guillotines, the, the lack of capacity for uh, committees to be able to deal with that legislative scrutiny in the way that we can in this house. I mean, sometimes we overdo it. The amount of time we spent yeah. <laughs> on the leveling up bill, for instance, yeah. is an example where, we, you know, we, I've, I've never experienced anything quite like it going into the early hours on committee, never mind report stage. But it, it does actually hold the government to account because ministers in the Lords who have a, a really difficult time are having to answer technical questions, deep questions that have not been dealt with as, it, as the, the legislation went through the Commons. And this means that they have to go back to the department, seek answers, accept when things are clearly not right. And people don't see, do they, that it's not just whether we win votes in the Lords and send amendments back to the Commons and have them overturned. It's very often that the government, quite rightly, hear what's been said on the floor of the House, think again, civil servants come back with an alternative, and the government themselves then move amendments that they've not had the space, time or the capacity to move in the House of Commons. So we're doing a job behind the scenes, which you're really well aware of, that half the population have never heard of. Exactly. They just, just don't know that that's what we're doing. If I remember correctly, the Constitution Unit 
stated that over 55% of the amendments that were successfully moved in the House of Commons had their origin in the House of Lords. And they did it uh, by that civilised engagement, uh, by the government listening, by them coming back. So from my point of view as Lord Speaker, it's uh, a bit erroneous to say that the House of Lords is just about voting the government down on amendments. It's a much more consensual approach, would you agree? Oh, completely. I mean, many of the really big issues that are debated and amended are totally cross-party. And if you think that, for instance, the official opposition, the Labour Party, uh, have less peers, fewer peers, I should say, than uh, the, uh, the crossbenchers, and the Conservatives have vastly more, more peers than any other party, you get the picture that it has to be by consensus to have carried these amendments at all. Um, L Labour and Lib Dem together can't carry amendments in the House of Lords. So uh, I think people need to understand the consensuality that you've described is a positive, not a negative. We, we haven't taken the party politics out of the House of Lords, but we're using the experience, both political and in all kinds of areas, from science and education uh, to the environment and climate change, right across the board. We're using that experience uh, to actually say, we might not be against what you're trying to do, but you're doing it in the wrong way and it's not going to work. And I would say that, by the way, but I would, wouldn't I, about the illegal immigration bill. We, we know what the government are trying to do. We know what the issues are, but we're trying to say, and we were trying to say until the bill became an act, um, there are other ways of doing this and this isn't going to work. So uh, from a constitutional point of view, having a second chamber that isn't bedeviled by simply having party whips being able to force people through the lobbies is vital. It's why, by the way, I'm not in favour of a, a directly elected second chamber, not just because I'm against gridlock and what happens in the United States, whose constitution is now completely out of date, but because actually, if you put people in on a purely party basis, they will act on a purely party basis, mm -hmm. irrespective of the other arguments uh, about claiming that the legitimacy and consent which election gives them uh, and would, uh, if it was on a, a proportionate, uh, which it would have to be in terms of regions and nations, a proportional basis, probably would start to claim they had greater uh, consent and legitimacy uh, than the House of Commons. And I don't think any of us should go down that road. Yeah. Well, if I remember correctly, the House of Representatives in America uh, was established before the Senate. But, but some people would say it's the Senate, it's the most influential and most powerful body there. Yeah, absolutely. And the most stable. The House yeah. of Representatives, a two-year term, which yeah, exactly. most of which is taken up fundraising and campaigning. Uh, and the Senate uh, are in on, 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 a, on a phased basis, so you have continuity. And, and we do provide in a, a bizarre way. I mean, I wouldn't argue for a minute that this isn't this institution of ours is not an anachronism, mm -hmm. but yeah. it works. And it could work a lot better if we had minor, the kind of uh, minor reforms, which again, across the house, people are agreeable to, if only the government would give the nod. And I'm talking about any incoming government as well. We mm -hmm. could reform ourselves very well and make, us, make this house more effective. Uh, I think um, more legitimate in the sense that people would uh, understand what we were doing better uh, and the profile and the reputation of the house would be would be better and then we can have the arguments down the line if people don't agree with what you and I believe that's fine but let's have the arguments on a on a basis of understanding and of information and of, of real fact rather than just a knee re knee jerk reaction that nothing is truly democratic unless it mirrors the House of Commons. In a couple of weeks, I'm given a lecture at the Royal Society of Arts. So I'll send you a copy, David, and we'll have a good coffee somewhere and have a chat about That'd it. That'd be okay. very nice, John. <laughs> now, I don't want to beat you about the head in terms of failures, but I've got to bring up the uh, IPP indeterminate sentences. Now, you have been very explicit that you got it wrong. Uh, it's been abolished uh, since 2012 but there are still over 3,000 people still in prison. Now, I don't want uh, to seek uh, 
your views uh, on it at the moment. I'm interested in terms of the machinery of government and the principles been put into practice. How did that happen, David? This, for those viewing and listening, is about indeterminate sentences, which did exist before 2003, yep. but on, not on the basis of a clear pathway for people to be able to demonstrate that they were, in, in, the, in the jargon, safe. And the arguments were about the nature of risk and whether people who were clearly at risk to the community should simply be allowed out on what are called determinant sentences, namely, you get the sentence, you serve it, and no matter what situation you're in, you're let out. And we came up with the idea, which arose from a detailed report called the Halliday Report, which I inherited from my predecessor, Jack Straw, that we should look at the idea of giving judges an alternative, which would be uh, an imprisonment for public protection, where the prisoner would receive uh, therapies and courses. They would then present to the parole board that they were no longer a risk and they would be allowed out. It went really, really badly wrong. It went wrong for a number of reasons. Firstly, I, ironically, we didn't have sufficient debate around it, either in the Commons or the Lords, because this was an enormous piece of legislation, the Criminal Justice and Sentencing Act 2003. Uh, on every other area, I I'm very proud of it. It was a seminal piece of legislation. On this, we needed more time. And I think pre-legislative scrutiny would have helped enormously. We, start, we've, we've started to have it, but not enough. And the House of Lords could do pre-legislative scrutiny uh, through committees, in, I think, in a very effective way. That would have highlighted some of the dangers. Dangers like uh, judges thinking that because this was part of a new act, they automatically had to implement it and use it. Secondly, what was the role of the Sentencing Council, which was chaired by the Lord Chief Justice, in terms of giving guidance and the kind of training needed to make this work? And thirdly, were we serious about putting the resources in to make it work? And on all those counts, we fell down, no question about it. And I've spent many years now, as you know, because we have debates and questions all the time on this issue in the Lords, which is entirely right. Uh, it's the kind of issue where things have gone wrong that the Lords again can play a part in the way that the Commons can't. We're like terriers. There's a group of us who are in, determined to try and bring about improvement and change. And I, I think the, as we speak, because we've had so many uh, Justice Secretaries, I can't even count how many since 2010, we, we think that the current uh, Justice Secretary is listening and we have been on the verge of getting improvement and then the Secretary of State get moved. So here we are in the Lords, constantly raising it, making ministers go back to their colleagues and raise the issues that we've raised and the debates we're having and demonstrating a consensus across parties which gives the governing party cover, political cover, in taking difficult decisions where the opposition won't immediately exploit them. And that's a unique position to be in for a government in a controversial area. So here we are, 11 years on, verging on 12 years on since the, the act was uh, overturned, and we've still got the best part of 3,000 people still subject to that legislation, half of, just under half of them still in prison and it's just not worked. So sometimes you have to put your hands up and say, we had the best intentions, the, the process didn't work, we got it wrong, and we need processes that can speedily put something right. So it's the machinery of governing, uh, that's a big issue here for you. Abs absolutely right. And that's why looking at how our Parliament works is fundamental to updating our democracy and retaining confidence in our democracy. And whilst I, I believe in participative democracy and the way citizens are enabled at local and, and national level to be able to participate, I think getting the processes of our 
Parliament right is, is fundamental to updating our constitution and making it work for a new era. And something as simple as pre-legislative scrutiny is really fundamental. You might not want to pre-legislative scrutiny the, the whole of an act. I mean, the um, online safety bill, massive piece of legislation. The leveling up bill, uh, almost a leviathan piece of legislation where the, where the content gets lost in the whole. But you might want to pick out, as we should have done with IPP, the, the specific issues that may be tricky in terms of the intention and the delivery or the controversy around how that infringes other parts of uh, the, the criminal justice system in this case. So we could pick pieces out and joint committees, we have some joint committees, we have... Human rights. Jo human rights joint mm -hmm. committee, we had it on the legislative scrutiny of, dare I mention it, the restoration and renewal of the Palace of Westminster, <laughs> Don't where me. very, very good things were raised. I was on that scrutiny committee. Um, sadly, things have gone astray since, but it's n entirely not down to the Lord Speaker, it has, to, <laughs> it has to be said, where actually the House of Lords, in many ways, in, in my view, I use the term um, deliberately, are more progressive, more, would, more forward thinking. And at that point, Lord Speaker, David, I've got the to... The bell has gone for a vote. I've got to interrupt. <laughs> and uh, you've got to go and do your business. And this is a good illustration at 12 noon that uh, not only do we start early, but we ensure that we've got the legislation tested. So after you've tested that legislation, you're welcome back, David. Well, I'm very grateful to you. And I'm in favour of earlier starts uh, on a Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. So here we are on a Wednesday in civilised time, uh, casting votes. And I'd better get the dog harnessed and get off to go through the lobbies and put my uh, card against the touchscreen as quickly as possible. Good. And it's Barley who's... Uh, Barley the dog yeah. is ready and willing to do it. Great. OK, and we'll see you Thank soon, Thank you very David. much, John. Thank you. If we'll only come... Barley had a vote, we'd yeah. be well away. But we'll see you soon. <laughs> we'll come back. <laughs> Thank you very great. much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Great, David. Good. David, you've had the toughest of beginnings. At an early age, you lost your father to an industrial accident. You left school early with little qualifications. Uh, what in your character, given how disability was treated 50, 60 years ago, what in your character uh, enabled you to overcome these obstacles? I think the honest answer is pig-headedness. I mean, pig-headedness has stood me in good stead in terms of overcoming those early challenges, deciding that I was going to use education as the ladder, the, the, the escalator out of poverty and disadvantage. And, yeah, but imagine the environment in which you were brought up, the societal environment, would not think that you would go ahead with education and get to university. No, the, the offer that was made to me at the time was piano tuning or uh, telephony uh, or secretarial. Now, I took the secretarial course uh, immediately post 16 because I had it in my head that if I could communicate well and I could uh, use Braille shorthand it would come in handy but I had no desire whatsoever uh, to end up doing that as a job although I did for two years uh, and they gave me day release from work and I took a business studies qualification and in the evening I, I went and did A levels um, so that the, the system worked in the sense that people enabled me to use my tenacity and my, um, I think you'd describe it as, as driven desire mm -hmm. to succeed. But I couldn't have done it without other people. So it's a two way street. You, you've got to put the, the effort in, but other people and society have got to be around you, giving you those opportunities. That's, that's my set of values and philosophy in terms of, of, of how we, sh we, we should proceed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was fortunate because I, I had those opportunities and although obviously there were ups and downs, I, I got to university by the age of 22, by which time I was just, um, I was already 
looking to what I might do in politics. You were, you were a councillor at 22, well, I was, I, Yes, at the end of my first year mm -hmm. um, at, at university, the opportunity came up in the ward in which I lived with my mum. And uh, someone left who was going to be the candidate and they went to South Wales for their job. And they said, we'll give you a go, which was incredible, really, because I was the youngest by at least 25 years on the council at the time. It's all changed since, but mm -hmm. it was like that then. And I couldn't see, and I was untried. And they took a risk, and that, that was the beginning. So other people, again, having confidence and being willing to give me a, a chance. And I think that's what we're about, isn't it? We're, mm -hmm. we, we, yeah. we, our our dri drive for equality is about giving people the chance the machinery and the mechanisms, the processes, the backing to make that chance viable and then supporting them through it. And the, the corollary of that is they get off their bum and they do something themselves. So, it, I mean, in my case, it didn't always work, but in my case, it worked and it, it, it inculcated in me a real belief that education was the fundamental driver. And it has done ever since. And as you'll gather from what I'm saying and what I've done, I, I'm still heavily involved in that today. In fact, our paths accord in that I left school early and went to night school. And it was the teachers in night school that gave me the support and the enthusiasm for going forward. So other people are very important to your progress. One teacher came down to the technical college, which wasn't outside the school, the school I was at, post 16 came down one night a week in his own time so that I could get O-level physics before I started to do the A-levels. And I knew I needed a science and I don't think they'd have been too happy with me doing chemistry because I think they'd probably have blown the place up. By the way, I was a chemistry teacher. Yeah. Don't well, worry about there, that. there we are, you see. So you'd know that a blind child mixing yeah. various uh, concoctions together was probably not a good idea. I didn't fancy the entrails were small animals, so I didn't do biology. biology. <laughs> Physics was horrendous. How I passed it, I do not know. Well, I think it was probably a combination of a very good memory for things I just had to repeat and the capacity, the beginnings of the capacity as a, as a politician, John, to be able to write the answers so ambiguously, knowing that the examiner knew the answer and presuming that they'd give me the benefit of the doubt. Okay, your determination from being young up to now it wasn't with the uh, end point ambition of ending up in the houses of privilege, which some people would say. So demolish that aspect. Never ever thought of the House of Lords, never crossed my mind. I mean, my mum would have been really chuffed if she'd been alive long, long. She was worried when I became leader of Sheffield because of the, uh, the bricks and everything that I mean, metaphorically, were being thrown at me at the time and the rough and tumble of politics. She'd have been very proud. But I never had the, the first idea about the House of Lords. And I think in my early years, yeah, I think I probably would have wanted not to uh, have an elected House of Lords. I probably would have wanted to abolish it. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, take on that point about this being a house of privilege, David. What's your experience? I don't think it is. I think it was when... Clearly, it was a wholly hereditary house. Yeah. Since 1958, gradually, that has been uh, removed down to the 92, two of them are ceremonial, let's call it 90, uh, who remain. And the changes that have taken place, it, it still has an ethos of pa the past, and you, you either adapt to it and try gradually, like a tortoise, to move it along I've, in the house. I think on the restoration and renewal, I use the analogy of the uh, of the hare and the tortoise, and I'm, I'm afraid we we have to deal with the House of Lords as being the tortoise. So you, you get your hair shot uh, if you if you think you're going to win by uh, rushing ahead. I, we we all adapt a little to that, but in doing so, we also push it along. So I think it's a, even in the eight years I've been in currently, the House of Lords has changed, and it changes. Uh, for the better, I think, in, in terms of gradualism. So, you know, the, anybody coming in to think that they're going to throw the, the, the place up and everybody's going to bow down and listen to them, 
got another thing coming. Good. It, the percentage of people in the House of Lords with a disability is greater than the House of Commons. Uh, you're a shining example of that, someone uh, with a disability that's coming in, but you've been very clear that you do not want to be seen as a voice for the disabled. Uh, why is that? I think the issues of disability and equality are ones for us all. And whilst this, this was true when I first became a cabinet minister because I had overall responsibility for disability issues. Whilst I will do everything to support and enable others to have their voice heard and to bring about change, I think the moment I say that I'm the spokesperson is the moment that I become the spokesperson. And that takes away the very raison d'etre of enabling others to have that voice and not for me to become typecast. I mean, if I had, then all the other things that I've been able to do would have had to take second place. So uh, as Secretary of State for Education and Employment, I introduced the Disability uh, Rights Commission, which was then incorporated in the EHCR in 2010. Uh, we updated the Disability Discrimination Act. We introduced measures in terms of uh, special schools and, and uh, the education needed for those who had additional needs. So I was able to do things, but I did them with and through other people. And I think the message for all of us, and it's, it's true of any campaigning program, is if you, if you narrow it down to those who have a particular requirement or a particular interest being the only ones who are seen as the spokespeople or can be heard on that issue, you've lost the plot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Uh, trust in politics, pretty low at the moment. Ten years ago, you published a book, Defence of Politics Revisited. You're still involved in U Sheffield University and other voluntary groups on that. What do we need to do to increase the public faith uh, or is it distrust in politics just something we have to live with? The politicians are never going to be the most popular, but can something positive be done? Well, so self-evidently, the first and most fundamental thing is how we, in formal, upfront uh, politics, behave, how we conduct ourselves. We've had lots of debates in here about this, because again, uh, led by a member of the House of Lords, the the committees uh, making recommendations on improvements to the way in which we deal with ourselves in the Commons and the Lords is, is critical. Secondly, to, to information and education fundamental, very difficult because of course, quite rightly, those in the fourth estate who hold us to account in the media and social media, the old media and the new media, are highly skeptical and that will always be the case and we've got to be able to deal with that. But thirdly, I think we've got to have a, a much more focused uh, an, uh, input at school and college level. I introduced the first national curriculum on citizenship and democracy back in 2001, which was implemented in 2002. And it has worked in part. There are many schools, about a third of secondary schools, teaching this really well. A lot is down to the head teacher and we need a focused approach to say let's give teachers the best possible material uh, and let, let us make the syllabus on this easier but let us ensure that all schools understand the critical importance that they're growing uh, an active citizen, they're growing an adult who will play a part in society and if those adults don't know how democracy works or doesn't work where power lies and how to influence it, then they're at a major disadvantage. And the, the haves already know. So it's a bit like mm -hmm. the Donald Rumsfeld, yeah. who used to be the Defence Secretary in the States, who talked about the known unknowns. Those who know are in the know, and they keep their hands on the levers of power. And those who don't find themselves excluded and often are the most sceptical about our formal democratic processes. So good education at school and college level could make a contribution but in the end every one of us in every speech we make in our behavior in the house and outside in the political arena we've got a part to play in winning people back 
to believing that what we're doing is not only worthwhile, but it's an absolute imperative to stopping something very, very much worse. Good. Uh, in You've mentioned the subjects of civic engagement and a communitarian approach in your speeches and your comments. What could Parliament, both Lords and Commons, do as an institution to further engage civic society? Because the more engagement there is, the more understanding there is, and therefore the tolerance levels go up. Yeah, our education service and outreach are very good and have improved enormously over the last uh, decade or so in terms of Parliament. Lots of young people coming in, lots of outreach in terms of online and support that you've given in terms of uh, MPs and peers going into schools and colleges, but mu much more than that, with uh, our own officials actually being prepared to go and give talks and lectures. and. I think there's a, a lot more we could do in terms of m modern means of communication, the putting together of programmes. Uh, we don't have the resource, of course, John, in mm -hmm. the Lords to do the kind of things we'd immediately want to do. Uh, but even a contribution like this podcast, like the, the initiative you've taken, is a small contribution. And small contributions, acorns create oak trees and if we can put those together and we can get across what I've just said and link it so that schools and colleges and the work they're doing linked to the outreach and the education service here then so much the better and I think that what we could also do is to ensure that Parliament is and there have been changes here more accessible than it's ever been so that when we're serving on select committees, which I now do, uh, we actually think all the time, how can we get these messages across? And with a very small communications team to try and make that happen. Great reports produced in this place, uh, which don't get a hearing because nobody knows about them. We, we had a select committee, which I served on under a conservative peer, uh, Robin Hodgson, on uh, citizenship and civic engagement. And what we've tried to do in the five years since we uh, produced the report was to keep harrowing everybody to keep come back it, coming back to it, including you. Absolutely, you came to, you've come to see me a few times. I have you? indeed, and the liaison committee that we have, and trying to get ministers to come back and, and answer, uh, and uh, other agencies like the Office for Standards in Education, to, to get across some of those messages. If we had a committee combined of all groups in the House, total unanimity of purpose, willingness to follow that through, that's a symbol of how this house works at its best. Yeah, exactly. You have an acute sense of contemporary society, but there's always a bit of you that's looking forward. Let's say after the next election, if the opportunity, given the circumstances, was offered to you to participate in a government of your liking, what would you do? Would you say, no, I'm too old, I'm just going to sit back? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was too old because you're as old as you feel. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is that I had my opportunity, I had those wonderful eight years in Cabinet at a particular moment in time when my, my talent and energy levels and, and experience were, were needed. But what I would like to do is to say to an incoming Cabinet and Ministers, if there's anything you want to talk about that I've had experience of, not just in government, but more widely, and you like a cup of tea, and knowing that you may take absolutely no notice, then please let's do it, because we lose that experience at our peril. And that means I wouldn't be interfering, I wouldn't be second-guessing, I wouldn't be trying to re repeat my, my, my career, if you like, in politics but I would like to try and carry forward the experiences and the knowledge that I've gained over those years. And that wouldn't be saying, let's go backwards. That would be saying, with all the pitfalls, all the elephant traps, all the possibilities of the future, let's draw on the, let's draw on the past, but not live in it. Let's look to the future by actually understanding history. And by God, I wouldn't be sitting here today if Adolf Hitler had understood history because he'd have never gone into the Soviet Union 
at the particular time of year and in the way he did. Uh, and it's a thought. Yeah, I've always put a stress on closer engagement with the House of Commons and Mr Speaker and I uh, uh, work very well in that area and I, I want to get it across that we look at Parliament rather than just the House of Lords and the House of Commons on that. But members of the House of Commons have spoken to, I've always felt that there was a positive element to them and I would like to do more to engage both houses. What ideas have you got? I think as part of the induction of members of parliament in the Commons, because obviously if we're alive, we'll still be here, uh, after a general election should include an element of that induction in terms of the workings of the two houses together. There's very poor induction anyway. A lot of it is about where your office is, how you connect with the independent parliamentary standards authority, uh, the, the proceedings of the House, get that completely. But a small element about how we work together, what the role of the Lords is, would not come amiss and it would help you and the Speaker of the Commons to be able to emphasise that this is a Parliament. There are two Houses, but this is our Parliament. And it is unique because we don't have an executive outside the Parliament. The executive is within the Parliament, so we don't have a presidency. We're not an assembly in that sense, uh, as with the French or with the House of Representatives in the States. We are special, and we're special in anachronistic ways, as I've described, but we're also a useful template. And if we could improve what we're doing substantially, I think we could enhance the standing and understanding of our democracy. Mm. The late Martin Luther King said that his advice was to young people and others, uh, when you wake up in the morning, ask what you can do for others. When you go to bed at night, ask what you've done. What's your advice to young people for the future, David? Believe that in even the smallest way, you can make the world a better place. And if it's a better place, for you, it's a better place for others around you. So don't take no for an answer. Participate when you can. Get a life, because quite often young people get involved in politics and it burns them out and it destroys their relationships and it nearly happened to me. Get a life, get a future, but please stay engaged because if you don't engage with decision making, if you don't vote, somebody else is voting for you, somebody else is making the decisions for you and in the end why grumble if you've disengaged? Okay, we were brought up in the tales of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Now that I've got you here we've got David Blunkett and the Seven Dogs. Whether it's Ruby, Teddy, Offa, Lucy, Sadie, Cosby and now Barley. How important have uh, these been to you in your life? Absolutely crucial. I got my first dog as I went to university and they've been a, a source of mobility, clearly, but also dignity and independence because in the five months when one of my dogs died, Cosby died, and I was waiting for a replacement dog, very lucky because this was way before, a couple of years before COVID and things were working 2018, well. 2018, wasn't it? Yeah, 2018. Mm -hmm. And things were working well in terms of replacement dogs. But in those months, I found a great deal about myself, about the relationship with others, about obstacles in this place that I'd never come across before. It was a life-changing experience in those months. And I was so very pleased and so privileged to have got a replacement dog at a time that made it possible for me to have retained my confidence, because that's really important in terms of mobility, just getting about, uh, my, my physical well-being, so that I could take on a dog, because it's, uh, it's a big challenge. I mean, dogs walk at their pace, although I, I actually have a two-gear two, two dog, because I can slow him down and speed him up with a, a little word. But actually, the dog walks as the dog wants to walk. That's keeping me fit. Lose your fitness, lose your confidence, and you're in real difficulty. Now, some people really happy uh, with using a white cane, no problem with that. 
Uh, we have two guide dog owners in this uh, yeah. house. We have Chris Holmes, who's a conservative peer, and myself. And I have to say that although Chris Holmes and I get on very well, our dogs don't. When they've passed each other, <laughs> uh, uh, just after a vote, there's been a bit of growling and a little bit of knocking about. And uh, I have to be very careful because my dog's bigger than his, so I don't want any accusations of bullying. Otherwise, I'd be in front of the committee. So you've got a consensual approach in the House of Lords, but the dogs, with dogs Lord have Holmes. taken a different exactly, you know, they, they've got a really aggressive <laughs> political stance to each other. <laughs> yeah, you can, um, you can, you can manage to train a dog in many things, but you can't necessarily in their political outlook. David, we came into the House of Commons at the same time, 1987, and since that first day, I've had a huge admiration for you uh, regarding your political acumen and your commitment to society as a result. So for me today, it's a real pleasure uh, and an opportunity and privilege to have you along, along with Barley. So that's thank very, you very that's much. That's very, very kind of you, Lord Speaker. John, you've been my friend. I reciprocate entirely, and I'm so glad that you're doing such an excellent job as Lord Speaker. Thank you, David. Now back to voting. <laughs>